Good morning, scholars of Earth and Environmental Science. Today, we will continue our discussion of Earth's water system by learning about the interactions of rivers, groundwaters, and estuaries. Not only are these reservoirs important to moderating how water cycles around the world, they are crucial sources of water for humans and are under threat from our practices. We should learn about these systems so we can become better stewards of our world. So first off, let's take a moment to stop and think. I'd like you to compare these two rivers. What do you notice? What might be the cause of these differences? Jot down a few notes after pausing the video and then continue. So we know that gravity causes things to fall. Gravity also causes water to fall. It pulls water down from areas of high elevation, the source, to areas of low elevation, the mouth. A river flows along the path of a channel between these two points. So the steeper the gradient between the regions, the faster the water is going to flow. A gradient is a lot like a slope, the change in height over the change in distance. The most dramatic example of a high gradient is a waterfall, where water drops off of a cliff, a very sudden change in elevation over a very short distance. Alternatively, over a gradual slope, water won't flow quite nearly as fast. Other streams, called tributaries, can flow into a bigger river. The region where all the streams drain into the same river is called a watershed. Fast-moving water is a powerful agent of erosion. Water can wear away at surfaces and then transport that material downstream. In this way, rivers act somewhat like a conveyor belt for sediment. The materials carried by a stream are called the stream's load. There are three types of load. The biggest is the bed load, which are pebbles and boulders. The middle size is a suspended load, where small rocks and soil are suspended in the water. And then the smallest size of particle is the dissolved load, where materials such as sodium and calcium are dissolved in the water. Now, in the lithosphere unit, we talked about a process key to the formation of sedimentary rocks, deposition. In this process, rock and soil are deposited by streams and rivers. This occurs when the speed of the water decreases. The water can no longer carry the sediment, and so it's going to fall to the bed or alongside the inside of a river bend. We see this process occurring in the bottom right picture. Along the outer edge of the bend, the material is being worn away. That's why we see the, sh the sheer cliff there. But on the inside, all of the load is going to be deposited. This will gradually change the course of a river over time and potentially produce landforms called oxbow lakes in the process as shown in the bottom left picture. So as the current slows, a river often deposits its load of sediment in a fan-shaped pattern. There are two of these fan-shaped patterns. One of them is a delta. For example, the Nile Delta forms where the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Take a look at the picture of the Nile Delta in the upper left. What do you notice? It's green, despite the desert surrounding it. This deposited sediment is rich in nutrients, which makes it possible to grow lots of plants. On the other hand, if that fan shape forms on land, we call it an alluvial fan. This is a semicircular deposit of rocks and other debris. It is formed when a fast moving mountain stream flows onto a flat plain, when you have a very quick change in a gradient. As the stream slows down, it leaves its deposits of sediment. 
So when you take a shower, all of the water coming out of the faucet gathers at the floor of a tub. This forms a single stream, which then runs into a drain. If we scale this concept up, you get a watershed, also called a drainage basin. This is the area of land that catches all the precipitation, rainfall, snowfall, etc., and then drains or seeps in th into streams, rivers, marshes, and eventually the ocean. Our state, North Carolina, has 17 river basins. The Hawassi, French Broad, Watauga, New, and Little Tennessee eventually make their way to the Mississippi River Basin, where they flow to the Gulf of Mexico. The New River, ironically, is one of the oldest rivers on Earth. It's actually older than the Atlantic Ocean. The rest of our river basins eventually flow into the Atlantic Ocean. Parts of Wake County live in the Neuse River Basin, while others live in the Cape Fear River Basin. Floods are a natural disaster caused on rivers. It is an overflow of water that submerges the land around it. This may happen due to water overflowing some natural boundary, or it may be due to water accumulation and it has no place to go. For example, if there's a lot of rain all of a sudden, or some natural disasters like hurricanes, those can cause flooding to happen. Floods are notorious for the damage they do damage to buildings and infrastructure. They can contaminate water, causing unhygienic conditions, which can spread around waterborne illnesses. Floods can also cause a shortage of food crops because an entire harvest can be lost when the floods rise and the non-tolerant plant species can die from suffocation. Although floods can be beneficial in some ways, they carry up silt and sediments rich in minerals from the river into the nearby soil, leaving a region of fertile earth called a floodplain. This was key to the formation of the early Egyptian civilization thousands of years ago. Regular floods coming from the Nile River served as an important source of irrigation. So we'll now talk about groundwater, and we need to know a few key terms. First is the idea of permeability. This refers to how easily water can flow through a material. Water can easily flow through materials like limestone, sandstone, gravel, sand, and soil, since the spaces between particles are connected. This gives water a continuous path to flow. However, Things like asphalt or concrete, water cannot penetrate through that, so it will flow on top. Impe impermeable surfaces like this can exacerbate flooding. Porosity refers to how much material can store water. It is a percentage of how much open space is in a volume of material. So if particles are the same size, there are many gaps where water can stay. But if particles are a variety of sizes, then the small ones plug the holes in between, leaving less space for water. The arrangement of particles can also affect how porous the material is. But the key takeaway here is that materials with bigger particles are going to be more permeable and porous. So as water infiltrates through the ground, it first passes through the zone of aeration at the very top. This is mostly air, but a bit of water is going to stay inside. Gradually, as water flows deeper, it will stop on impermeable surfaces and begin to accumulate as the zone of saturation. The boundary between these zones is called the water table. So I'd like you to stop and think again. Think about some factors that might influence the water level underground. What might be the impact of taking out too much water from the ground? So pause the video, jot down a few notes, and then continue. 
So in aquifers, water can move freely and is stored in these underground reservoirs. Water stays between tiny pores. It is not a continuous underground lake or river. It's a very common misconception. And just like batteries, the water table level in aquifers is a delicate balance of recharge and discharge. Aquifers can be depleted when water is taken out. This usually happens through evaporation, but also through human extraction, through wells. Wells are big holes that dip into the water table, and then pumps can pull out water for drinking or irrigation. Over time, an aquifer can be restored when some surface water infiltrates through the ground. Although if discharge is faster than recharge, an aquifer's water level will gradually decrease, and some wells that used to draw from it could run dry. Depletion can also lead to subsidence, where the ground collapses and creates a sinkhole, since there is less water around to support the overlying rock. While wells are artificial creations of people, springs and artesian wells are natural places where the groundwater can emerge. It's somewhat like a volcano, where water deep underground at high pressure can work its way out through fissures in the ground to emerge at the surface. When wells extract water from an aquifer, it decreases the level of the water table, and the water pressure locally will drop. This creates a cone of depression. Now, salt water usually stays below fresh water due to its higher density. But through the suction from pumping in coastal areas, this can bring up the salt water from below the freshwater aquifer. This salt water intrusion is a problem because it can cause contamination of drinking and irrigation water. We'll be discussing more issues with the use of water resources and how to conserve them later in the course. Let's stop and think again. Why do you think estuaries? These are regions near the coast where fresh and salt water mix. Why might they be important? Pause the video, jot down a few notes, and then continue. So an estuary occurs where a river meets the ocean and fresh and salt water can combine to form brackish water. Estuaries are influenced a lot by the tides, waves, and storms. In general, the salinity of the water will increase as you get closer to the ocean or during high tide where the ocean level rises. Estuaries are important first and foremost because they are a habitat for animals and plants. More than 150 species of fish and invertebrates live in North Carolina estuaries. Some species use different habitats within the estuary system during different stages of their life cycle. Underwater plants cover about 200,000 acres on the coast of North Carolina. And a lot of these submerged plants produce oxygen and nutrients, which are used by the animal species. Estuaries also control erosion and flooding. Their sandbars can buffer waves. Plants and shellfish beds anchor the shore against the tides. Swamps and marshes absorb high winds and water from heavy rains and storm surge. This gradually releases the water into rivers and groundwater supplies. Estuaries also filter out toxins. Bacteria and microorganisms, they break down larger chemicals with processes of aerobic respiration, sulfate reduction, and the creation of methane gas. Salt marsh plants will trap some chemicals and pathogens and move them into the soil where they are neutralized. Oysters, like the ones depicted in the upper right corner here, filter out impurities from the water, and they eat this, trapping the toxins inside their bodies. Lastly, estuaries are important in 
our economy. Three quarters of the fish caught commercially in the United States live in estuaries. On average, estuaries produce more food per acre than our most productive farmland. And about 30 commercial fishing species live in North Carolina's estuaries. Estuaries are also major sites for tourism and recreation. I'd like you to stop and think again. What might cause the destruction of these estuaries? And why might their destruction cause a problem? So pause the video, jot down a few notes, and then continue on. Since European colonization, nearly half of North Carolina's wetlands have been lost, and coastal development continues to damage wetlands. Humans develop land for habitation and use. We build roads, bridges, culverts, sewer systems, pipelines, and dams. These all change the flow of water through the ecosystem. Asphalt and concrete, they deflect water so that it runs off with all the contaminants directly into the rivers. And these rivers channel all the contaminants into the estuaries. All the pollutants washed away by precipitation, they're funneled into the estuaries where they can concentrate. This can harm local animal and plant species. Dredging river channels and the nearby sea also damages plants and oyster beds because this stirs up the sediment and clouds the estuary water, making it difficult for plants to photosynthesize. Global climate change, which we'll talk about in a couple of units from now, is a major cause for rising sea levels. This also threatens swamp forests, which can only withstand temporary flooding or drying. The hurricanes, exacerbated by climate change, also cause high water levels. This can erode the shoreline and flood organisms typically adapted to fresh water with ocean water. And together, sea level rise and storms can cause North Carolina's wetlands to erode at a rate of about 800 acres per year. Finally, an excess of nutrients can also be harmful to estuary systems. Sewage treatment plants, septic systems, polluted air, and fertilizers deposit nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus in the rivers, which ultimately concentrate in the estuaries. High levels of these nutrients can create large growths of algae called algal blooms, which can block the sunlight from penetrating below. And so as algae dies, its decomposition consumes oxygen, and then fish and invertebrates have a much harder time breathing and they can suffocate and die. So on that note, it's important to maintain these very delicate water systems and monitor our use of our water resources so that all animals and plants can have a good time and survive. So this is all for today. Tune in next week for our introduction to weather and the atmosphere. Have a good week.